We have a special guest to help us go through some of the facts and some of the fiction about Ebola, especially now that it is front and center once again with a second health worker from Dallas uh, positively tested for Ebola. Joining us now, Dr. Mary Schmidt. Uh, she's an infectious disease expert, also a former Inova Hospital uh, chief of staff. Uh, thanks for being here. Thank you. You're intimately involved in this. You're currently helping uh, still with the, in this area. Overall, how concerned as a country should we be about this? I believe what we need to be concerned about is the way we're providing care to our health care workers in, in the hospitals. We have the ability to do our best for the patients, but I'm concerned about the interaction that right now the CDC and those experts who tend to be scientific experts and experts in understanding uh, how the disease works and how to prevent it from communicating this to our health care workers on the ground ground and we have to wonder a little bit about the ability to manage and govern uh, and act as an oversight body of a serious problem. Yeah, because you have hospitals across the country, obviously, who are looking for specific protocols and maybe don't have all of the, the training that they need. Tell exactly. me what you think may have happened in Dallas. I have to say that some of us were a little concerned when we saw the initial types of recommendations for Ebola. They weren't quite as, as protective and rigorous as even people who deal with this in the lab. So the question is, was it an equipment problem? Was it a break in protocol? Or were there unforeseen virus particles in some of the other potential contaminated room uh, areas near the patient, not in the caregiving area or the room where the patient's located, but in what we call the anteroom, where some labs may have been done, where the doning of the gowns were coming on, coming off. What is that room also potentially contaminated? I mean, we'll get into kind of the gross aspect of this. I mean, someone with Ebola, there's a lot of bodily yes. fluid that these nurses are dealing with, vomit, diarrhea, even blood. Yes. And that's really where the transmission comes. Yes. For somebody on a plane, mm -hmm. what do they have to worry about? Well, it depends on the symptoms the patient's having. If they're just sitting there with a fever and not having any kind of uh, pro any kind of blood production, diarrhea, vomiting, or having any kind of saliva or tear production, then the person sitting around them is in should not be in harm's way, although we have a rule in, in these kind of public health contact isolation that three feet, we use that for different types of meningitis and some other similar types of infections where we feel that if someone was outside of the three feet zone, they were probably okay. Now in a small contained aircraft, you also have somebody who's using the restroom. So one of the things I would hope they're being absolutely secure about is whether or not uh, the nurse, our second unfortunate victim here, let's call her, uh, had any contact or any kind of illness in that restroom because certainly they're not cleaned and sanitized after each use. Yeah, I mean, we've been told the plane's been put aside. As she said that she didn't have any of those issues on that flight. Um, but for somebody sitting anywhere near there, and by the way, we should point out the CDC is trying to contact everybody on that flight Yes. Uh, to have the, the contact. Um, but somebody sitting there and she coughs or sneezes, is that something that can transmit? The, the um, air vaporization of someone who doesn't have um, active, uh, I guess I could use the term spewing of, say, tears. We know tears are infected. Uh, we know saliva can be. So to be quite honest, if somebody does have um, we'll say like an open mouth cough, and we all know that we've been exposed or to sneeze. those. Or, 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 well, it shouldn't be replicating in the nasal passages per se, but it can be in the tears in the mouth. And so I would say if, if saliva somehow came out through the nose or in the mouth, that that could be a source of an infection. Or they, you cough into their hand, and the saliva gets on the hand, and they then touch something else. Exactly. Exactly, okay. that is I mean, definitely a concern. I mean, it sounds a little bit more uh, contagious than maybe the CDC has been talking about. They say it's very hard to get Ebola, but the way you're describing it here, it's not that hard. 
Well, it's hard to get Ebola unless you're within three feet of somebody with Ebola. Yeah. And you're and you're can come in contact with their saliva. Yeah. Um, there are. You've looked at suspected cases around this area. Um, obviously, the CDC doesn't mm -hmm. talk about all the suspected cases. Right. Correct. There have been more than we've heard about. And particularly living here in the Washington, D.C. area, we have people coming in from lots of African countries. We'll, we'll use that because that's a sort of our concern right now. With signs and symptoms of fever, most of them have had malaria. We know about the one uh, at Howard, but um, we're screening people on a regular basis for Ebola. Should these flights coming in from those affected countries be stopped for the time being? I believe that we're doing a better job there of preventing people who have ha signs and symptoms of not getting on planes. It's a good question. I don't understand. You probably know better some of the political ramifications of doing that. It would certainly prevent anyone with potential Ebola from getting into the country. There's so many other considerations. But they can fly somewhere else and come in if they really want to be here. So I do think there's a little fault in that yeah. theory. I mean, the, the, the response always is, well, we want to be able to keep the avenue open to respond there and for health workers to get out. It doesn't really seem like that makes sense, totally. Um, well, right now we have somebody who knew that they had an Ebola exposure who got on a plane in the United States. I'd have no idea. I, I just have no idea why somebody hadn't sat down with her ahead of time and read a strict policy and procedure. I mean, talk about protocols. Yes. Yeah. Um, anything we're not talking about that we should be talking about when it comes to this issue? One of the things on the table today that the CDC is is entertaining at, with flying the second victim to uh, Emory. Emory is should, is it best practice for every patient to be sent to a hospital who's done this and where a healthcare worker has not gotten infected? Is there something that they're doing that, that has not yet been communicated to all the other hospitals? One of the interesting things I found in our discussions was we're given these pieces of paper, we're on telephone conversations with somebody trying to tell us best practice, but there's nothing like having people come on site. And we have, with new technology, the people who are educating healthcare workers about new technology, they're always in the hospital. They're always showing people how to do this, what to do. They come into the operating rooms, they're on the floor, and it is surprising to me that no one went to those units and walked these healthcare providers and the team through what's the right equipment, how do we use this equipment, and what's the best process. Something tells me they will now. Yeah. Dr. Schmidt, thank you so much for being here. Thank you.